Now, we uh, launch a brand new series today. In the next four weeks, I want you to know why and where we're going. So the first is this. It's called You Are Here. You ever been to the mall? And fellas, I'm speaking to you specifically, okay? You go to the mall, and you're not going to try on 17 outfits and not buy one, okay? That's not how we roll, okay? I'm on a mission, and when I get to the mall, because I'm unfamiliar with it, I go to this kiosk placard, and it's by the information center, and it says this, you are here. And then I go, okay, I'm getting shoes from that store. I should be there in a, a full seven minutes, including purchasing, right? And then I can go back into the rest of my life, right? But if you, don't, if you don't have clarity of where you are, it's really difficult to know how do you get to where you're going. And I want to say this for, for, for us here at Gateway. We, we don't have a new mission. Oh, new pastor, new mission. No, it's the same mission we've had since the birth of this church, what we might be doing is, is bringing some clarity to language, but I want to say it this way. To go to a place we've never been before, we have to go past where we normally stop. And that's true in our faith, in our relationships, in our fitness, in our finances. So today I'm going to talk about the why. You are here, but what's the why of church you know, since Jesus came on the scene, lived a sinless life, went to the cross on our behalf, was buried and rose from the dead, the launch of the church, it has had a purpose. It's on purpose for his purpose. The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit's poured out and the church was scattered after being empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is not new. We continue that today here on the peninsula. So today I'm going to talk about the why. Next week I'm going to talk about the what. Presenting hope and developing people. Our response to Jesus' why sets some things in motion to us. Then week three we're going to talk about the how. And Pastor Mario is going to talk to us about the two pedals that move the mission of Gateway Forward. Gatherings, you're in one now, and groups. You know when you most grow is not just in this setting. It's when a couple other people are speaking life, going on a mission with you. I had breakfast with some fellas Saturday morning. I left. I told my wife, I'm like, that was just great. Was it super spiritual? No, it was just like guys hanging out. Those are critical things. Now, are there spiritual moments? Yeah, but it's gatherings and groups. And the last one is who. And here's the answer to who is invited on the mission of Jesus. Everyone. <laughs> like, well, but what about everyone? So today we jump into this critical question of why. And you hear me say this before, you'll hear, hear me say it again. Jesus is not our last hope, he's our only hope. And we don't shrink back from that. We don't feel bad about that. It's, the scripture says he's the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. And what we get when we jump into the Bible and we get into the gospel specifically is this incredible truth, and that's when we couldn't get to him, he came to us. The difference between the two is me trying to get to God as religion. God coming to, to us is Christianity in relationship. So one summer Saturday morning when I was in elementary school, my family, before they moved back here to Paulsbo, we lived in Vancouver, Washington. And uh, our, our, my mom and dad were part of a, a, we called it a life group, I think, but it was a small group. And so we were at someone's house and they're in studying, praying, encouraging each other, eating. And I'm with all of the kids. My twin sister and I were with the kids. And one of the dudes from the host home said, hey, there's a rope swing over in the woods. I'm like, sign me up, okay? So I don't know if you've noticed this about me, but I'm a little bit competitive, okay? And so uh, I always want to jump higher and go farther. I rarely do. I still want to, okay? Now my goal is different. Now it's like, don't get injured, right? The bar shifts, okay? <laughs> and everything shifts, okay? No one here is laughing because they're like, why is that? Everyone else is like, yeah, I get it. Hurt my back getting out of bed. You know, was that a burning house fire? No, got up. Right, I get it, okay? By the way, youth, I'm going to be with you this Sunday. I'm preaching at, at Gateway Youth this Sunday, or this, this Wednesday. So we'll look forward to seeing you guys. Okay, so, uh, you know on a rope swing where it goes, Ooh, and then you feel that slight weightlessness for just a moment, the rope catches and you swing back. I didn't feel that second part of it because I went out, zoop, and the rope broke, okay? <laughs> Did I wear a pants that were considered husky? 
yeah, but I wasn't super heavy. The rope was frayed, so quit judging. And uh, <laughs> so I fall. This is a true story. I fall into a, a blackberry field. <laughs> not a bush, not a patch, a field. Okay, because the, the, the tree... <laughs> Swings out over the field. Seemed like a great design until all the rope broke. And I'm now, I'm not exaggerating when I say I'm stuck in this blackberry. And I'm thinking, I had stuff I wanted to do. I'm, you know, fifth grade. Um, <laughs> guess this is my life now, right? I'll have enough food to eat for two more weeks until the blackberries are gone, right? So I'm like, hey, here's what I said. Go get my dad. Oh, that's a whole message right there. And a beautiful message. And I just imagine the person running up. Um, Jeffrey's stuck. Where is he stuck? He's in blackberries. I'll tell him to get out. He can't. Right? So you had to convince them to get from their small group to, he comes down and he walks down and he has two two by fours. And I'm like, I have no idea what he's doing, you know? And he sets one of them down and steps on it and it tamps down. And then he reaches back and he grabs the other one and he steps on that one and he made his way to me. When we couldn't get to God, God came to us. You were and I was and anyone pre-experiencing the grace and the freedom of Christ. We are stuck in our sin and our selfishness. We're stuck in these patterns of brokenness, but God made a way. And, and so the why of Jesus is the heart of today. When we couldn't get to God, he came to us. And we read this in um, 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin or to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What does it mean? It means outside of Christ, you can't be in right standing with God. Your best effort isn't enough. So God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Jesus took our sin, lived a sinless life, but he took our sin. So that in him, we might, what? We might experience and become in right relationship with God. That's what Jesus set set in motion. Now, that introduces us to this whole beautiful theological term called propitiation. Try to weave that into your lunch conversation, okay? (laughs) Propitiation is this. Simple definition. It's not that your sins don't count, but in Christ, and because of Christ's work on the cross and the empty tomb, they no longer count against you. That's the message of the gospel. God does for us what we can't do for ourselves. Now this whole story, the whole why behind Jesus coming to earth is is the theology of of atonement and of the cross. And theology is the study of God. But I I really want to invite us not just to have theology, but to have applied theology so that we don't just study God, but we study and apply his truth to our lives. Back one book, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, here's what it says. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The person that's anti-God got burned by something. They're like, why would someone who's innocent die for the guilty? The message of the cross, Jesus taking our place, seems like foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's a reminder, I can't rescue myself, so he went to the cross to rescue me. And this is true for every person and all of humanity all through time. And it's what makes grace amazing. And we say this all the time around here. The message of the cross is that your goodness doesn't get you in, but your badness doesn't keep you out. Some of us, we have, we've had these whispers of the enemy, or you grew up in a religious setting, and, and you think you forfeited God's favor. You didn't. You were never that good or bad. It's a gift from God. And the cross boldly declares that all of us can experience a new life and freedom in him. So we go to this verse, which is foundational for our faith. And if you, 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 many of you have heard it before. For others, this will be the first time. And it's Jesus answering his why. And here's what it says. It says, for Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He came, his why was to seek and to save. So here's the question, who's lost? 
And the answer is everyone. All of us are born with the sin nature. Listen, the nicest person in this building still has a sin nature. Your great aunt, who is so prim and proper, needs Jesus. The most kind person, the the most generous, because it's not about what we do. Our sin nature, immediately we're born with the separation from God. And sin set that in motion. And Jesus, because of the love of the Father, says, I'm going to set in motion a search and rescue mission so that humanity can be found and saved and rescued. So Jesus' why was us and every person in humanity who starts off lost. Now, this is not breaking news for any of us, right? That we have sin, right? Because you know you and you know others. Now, it's easier to point out sin in other people. I'm super good at that. <laughs> but we're mindful of it in our own lives, aren't we? So here's the story. Here's where, here's where Luke 19.10 comes from. Here's the context. By the way, here, and I love Pastor Mario's message last week, powerful. And we're committed to exegesis, not eisegesis. And here's what that means. Exegesis is the proper interpretation and application of God's word. Eisegesis is the twisting of scripture. Okay, so we want to, where did this come from? What's the context? Here's the context. Jesus entered Jericho. Jericho is a city in modern day Israel, and it's 3,500 feet below uh, Israel, or not Israel, but, but Jerusalem, which is up on, they say mountain, it's really like a steep hill, okay? And Jericho's down in the, the Jordan Valley, and Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, but he's passing through Jericho. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, who was a, or he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy, The author did not have to say, and he was wealthy, because every chief tax collector was rich. Here's why. They were stealing money from their people to pay taxes to Rome. So the best way to describe this would be if if the United States was invaded by pick a nation, and they needed people to excise tax from us, and they chose your neighbor as one of the chief tax collectors, and so now his job was to get not just the money he you owed the government, but it would be above and beyond. It was normal for him to be a cheat, and he would be he would be invited by that ruling government to take your money. So his driveway has a Lamborghini, and you have a scooter. And you're like, what is going on here? That is the chief tax collector. They took taxes from his, their people to give to the Roman government. And they were despised. They were hated. Matthew, one of the disciples, was in the same category. So Zacchaeus had a reputation that preceded him. Okay, jump down to verse 3. When he, he wanted to see Jesus, or who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. For him, it was a physical limitation. So he ran ahead, he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since he was coming that way. Okay, so picture it. Jesus is on the way. Zacchaeus climbs up a tree. Very few people notice. The ones who did probably were like, I hope he falls, right? <laughs> Guy's a jerk, okay? He, he gets to where he can see Jesus. Jesus, because he's God, knows that Zach's up the tree, right? But Zacchaeus has no idea. He just, he wants to get a glimpse of who this Jesus character is. And I want to propose this to you, Gateway. Every one of your neighbors and coworkers and family members wants the same thing. Even if they don't articulate it. There's something missing in all of our lives without Christ. And for some of them, they've climbed the ladder of relationships. If I could just find the right him or her. If I can just get that promotion, if I can get in the right shape, but we have whatever ladder we try to climb to meet that need in us, but all of us need to see and experience relationship with Jesus. For Zacchaeus, he climbed the tree because he was challenged physically in height. So he got to where he could look over the crowd. People are gathered along the side of the, the path or the roadway. And Jesus pulls up and he, he stops. He says this, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and and he said to Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I'm going to come to your house. I got to stay at your house today. And so he he's thrilled. He's like, everyone around me doesn't like me. And Jesus wants to come hang out at my house. So he came down at once 
and he welcomed him gladly. So as the story unfolds, Jesus goes to his house and all of the religious people are like, what? You're like, what is he doing? And here's the next verse. All the people saw this and they began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. And here's the, here's the tension. The people who were following Jesus wanted to make it hard for other people to follow Jesus. And this is the tension all of us live with. And so Jesus got this reputation as someone who was a, and it wasn't a compliment, but as a friend of sinners. And when I was reading this and reviewing and praying and studying, I felt like the Holy Spirit caused me to pause for a second and say, okay, Jeffrey, what would people say about you? I'm not talking about you right now. I'm, I'm literally saying for me. Am I a friend of sinners? When, when I walk in a room and there's people, when I, by the way, people don't wear the label, oh, I'm a sinner, you know? Oh, you're from Gorst, you're a sinner, you know? <laughs> I'm not saying Gorst, I'm saying, let me start again, okay? <laughs> that didn't come out right. <laughs> How, and then, and so, back to my notes. <laughs> What I'm saying is we don't walk in a room and go, well, that person's a sinner, right? And any more than we say, hey, they live in Gorst. How's that? Better? <laughs> okay. We're all sinners. But the people who had been a little further along in their faith wanted to make it difficult for this guy that's trying to find Jesus. And they said, well, Jesus is a friend of sinners. And you know what? Let it be marked the gateway was is and will continue to be a place where people who are addicted and abused and broken and thinking they forfeited God's favor will walk into the doors of this church and feel loved and cared for. That when we, not, not just at church, but as we go out these doors as the church, we would be a friend of sinners. And that the heavy lifting of changing the heart of a person, which by the way, you and I can't do, but the Holy Spirit would work and then we would just play a small part in watching their lives transformed. I will ask, so how do people describe you and I? We see this, Jesus goes to his house and by the way, the Holy Spirit's already working and we see Zacchaeus stood up and he says, look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. <laughs> I love this next line. And if I've cheated anyone, and everyone's like, you've cheated people, okay? <laughs> That's nice that you say that, but you've definitely cheated people, okay? I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay it back four times the amount. This was not a moment of salvation. Him, him making restitution didn't make him saved. It was the obvious evidence of his heart being transformed that now he responds to say, I need to make something right with other people. This is critical. Why does this matter? I wrote in my notes, his acts of restitution had nothing to do with his salvation. It just revealed his heart change. And why this is so important is that salvation is a gift. And you can't earn a gift. Zacchaeus, seeing Jesus, interacting with Jesus, was convicted, repents, and then says, now how do I respond? By the way, the, it's his kindness, the scripture says, that leads us to repentance. We never need to beat anyone over the head with the Bible. We don't have to. The Holy Spirit's already wooing and softening and breaking down the hard heart to bring them to Jesus. Because salvation's a gift, you can't earn it. And the Apostle Paul, who we'll talk more and more about, is, if you already know who he is, this is great, but for those that are new to faith or investigating faith, the Apostle Paul, who I'm going to share a verse in a second, he wrote, was going full speed the opposite direction of God's plan. And he had an encounter similar to Zacchaeus uh, with Jesus, repented, and now is on mission with Jesus. And he would go on to write two thirds of the New Testament. And one of the letters he wrote was to the church in Rome. And here's what he says. I'm sorry, this one's in Ephesus. He says, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith and this not from yourselves. You know why he put that? Because all of us would tend to go, I made that happen. <laughs> 
did, did, I mean, I've shared this before. When we had a lawn that we would mow, I don't, we right now live in an apartment. I would mow the lawn and have Joanne come look at the lines. <laughs> like, doesn't, look at these lines. <laughs> this looks great. <laughs> right? You, you, by the way, this is, this is all free, but if you're going to do any yard work, have people look at it before you do the work. Because otherwise they're like, well, that looks really nice. They have no idea how bad it was before. Okay, so if you're really going to get credit, let them see it ahead of time. I'm playing with you. Okay, I hope you caught that. Zacchaeus, in this moment, started with, look what I did. Arrogance, pride, greed, and the Holy Spirit working on him, him and having an encounter with Jesus. He now shifts to, look what I did. And, and no one had to beat him over the head with anything. It was the love of God softening and drawing him to faith. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Why? Sin stains. The confession begins to cleanse us. And it invites us from this brokenness marked by our regret to a place of I'm beginning to have relationship with God and my life starts to get in alignment, in right standing, in righteousness with God. And then we see this. Jesus finishes the conversation. He says to him in front of everyone, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a child or a son of Abraham. What that means is he's included in that covenant relationship that God set in motion all of these years before. And then Jesus says this, the last thing in this, in this conversation, he says, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the why behind the what of gateway church and the church throughout all of the world. Now, Paul did write this letter to the church in Rome, and he says this. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates, he puts on display his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's the message of the gospel. That is the why behind everything we take steps on the what's and the who and the how. So what does it look like for us to present hope and develop people? It means that we look at the unlikelies, like a Zacchaeus, through a different lens. We start to recognize that in the same way that God was gracious and patient with us, we extend that same thing to people in our lives. You know why this matters so much? Because heaven and hell are both real. That when we step into eternity, we're going to either spend eternity with God or apart from God. And honestly, the thing that makes hell so horrific is the separation from the presence of God, the love of God, the care of God, the nurture of God, and the communion of the family of believers. I don't know. I don't know about you, and I'm just I'm, I'm reflecting on what God's doing in my life. It's so easy to forget about eternity and be so fixated on all the stuff in front of us right now. I kiddingly talked about the Seahawks. I'm, I'm excited to watch the game later, but I, I can actually come into church and be like more excited to go sit and eat and watch the Seahawks than go. How is my life having anything to do with eternity? We, we can be so earthly minded that we don't have a heavenly impact. And this, this is just a reminder, we're joining Jesus on this incredible search and rescue mission. First of all, we need to be saved. But after we've experienced his love and his grace, we start to ask now, God, who, who have you positioned me? Who have you strategically put me next to? Who's in my world that I can bring a little bit of that hope and that peace and ultimately the presence of Christ into conversations? And we say this often, but people will often see the gospel before they hear about it. And that's just fine. That our lives would display the kindness of God, the goodness of God, 
So where are we going the next few weeks? I want you to hear this. The why of Jesus informs our, our what, and it instructs us into our, our how and our who. So the next few weeks, we're going to be asking, what is our part? What does it look like to be on mission with Jesus? And the most simple four words we can use is presenting hope and developing people. I had a conversation. I finished with this. Um, some of you would know who this is. Um, his name is Billy Graham. And um, for those of you that don't know, he was an incredible, prolific person proclaiming and, and declaring the gospel good news of Christ all over the world. In fact, probably no one else in history um, has had the public ability to do that greater than him. And he was at SeaTac at a, at a hotel, and I heard about it because I was picking up a guy. And uh, they said, hey, Brother Billy's in the room. I'm like, what? So I go in. I'm like a 22, I think, Joanne. We were 22-ish year old youth pastor. And so I'm like, I'm sorry, Mr. Graham, to interrupt your breakfast. Uh, but I said, if you could say one thing to a young pastor, what'd you say? And I'm like, you know, ready. He said, I would preach John 3, 16 and 17 more. And here's what that verse says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him, they wouldn't perish, but would have eternal life. And God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to rescue, to save the world through him. That is the why of Jesus. And today, as a church, we just come back to, this is what's been our foundation, this is our foundation, and it will continue to be our foundation. And you and I play a part in it. Well, we ask the question as we respond every week, how do we live this out? So maybe you would say, today I'm gonna join Zacchaeus in responding to the love of Jesus. And just like Zacchaeus, you would say, I'm going to surrender my life to Christ. I'm going to invite Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Every week in every gathering, we create that opportunity. And if you want to pray a prayer, it can be as simple as Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I invite you to be Lord of my life. And today I choose to follow you. See, we, we have made the gospel complex. Jesus made it simple. We were lost, and in him we can be found. The, the second thing to consider is this. Maybe uh, you would say, I, I will be and want to be a friend too, and you might plug in that unlikely. Maybe it's a coworker or a neighbor or a family member. You'd say, but here's the deal. For some of them, they, they've chased relationships. Like everyone wants to see Jesus. Everyone's ladder is a little different, but all of us are trying to figure out how do I, how do I see and experience Jesus? Because there's something in us that longs for that. So maybe you'd say, I want to join Jesus on that mission and I'm going to be a friend. And whoever that unlikely is, by the way, you were all unlikelies before Jesus. We're all at the exact same place. And the last thing is this. You would say, with God's help, I want to align or realign my why with his. That Jesus came to seek and save the lost. God, what's my part in proclaiming that truth? How does my life live the good news of the gospel? Gateway, when we do that, our community, local and global, will be impacted. Would you bow your heads with me as I close? Lord, thank you. Thank you for stories in your, in your scriptures like Zacchaeus. And God, how the seemingly unlikely experienced the grace and the forgiveness that you offered. And God, thank you that this is a room of people and we are your why. The greatest search and rescue mission in all humanity that you set in motion by sending your son. For God so loved the world. We say thank you, God. And today, God, in response to that, some of us are gonna surrender our lives to you. And many would say, Lord, what is my part in joining you on your mission? Lord, we pray for the story of Gateway Church as you write this next chapter. That our 
response would be the clarity of your why, that you came to seek and to save the lost. And we pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.